All right, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Modern Wong Chat. I think we're on episode 35, 6, 7, 7, I believe. So it's fun. It's fun to count this and finally getting somewhere. And I'm having a lot of fun making this. And I hope you all enjoy watching and listening as well. As always, we are live on Twitch at twitch.tv slash photo. Uh, you can also watch this on YouTube and you can also listen to this on major podcast platform like um, iPod, uh, iTunes or uh, what's that one? Spotify. So yeah, it's a lot of fun. I get to talk to my friends from different industry, a lot of gaming, a lot of cosplay, a lot of just everywhere. Uh, and tonight we get to talk to another voice actor, uh, Mark, Mark. Mir? I think it's Mir. I'll let him make sure I didn't get it wrong because I, I don't want to butcher it or anything. Uh, but yeah, he is a voice actor. You might have heard of him from a game called Mass Effect. Uh, and he is uh, Commander Shepard. Um, he's also a really awesome guy. I actually met him in New Zealand. So I'll just let him explain more. So yeah. What's up, Mark? Hey, I'm Martin. Thanks for having me. And yes, you pronounced my name correctly. Mark Mir. Mir. Is it like... What's the origin of the last name? Like, uh, well, my dad's actually uh, from South Africa, so it's actually, uh, but he's of Indian extraction, so it's an Indian name. Oh. Uh, but there are there are Dutch people that also have the last name Mir. Okay, all right. Odd, oddly enough. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, how, how's quarantine so far for you? <laughs> well, I have been painting a lot of miniatures and uh, mm -hmm. playing a lot of Dungeons and Dragons on Zoom. Uh, with my friends in the UK and New Zealand, actually, uh, and uh, I've been I've I've been doing that twice a week with in that particular campaign and doing a bunch of other guest appearances and other people's uh, RPG shows. I actually just did uh, a show with Mass Effect Adventum, and they are actually do a, Ma a Mass Effect role playing game using the D20. Gotcha. So that was a lot of fun. Uh, so yeah, it's mostly been it's been stuff on Zoom, uh, the occasional improv show on Zoom. As a matter of fact, I'm doing one with Colin Mockery on uh, mm. from Whose Line Is It Anyway on Saturday. That's My favorite awesome. company is uh, yeah we we do a show called Improvised Dungeons and Dragons, which is I know all Dungeons and Dragons is improvised, but this is specifically <laughs> a comedy show. It's a comedy show with improvisers as the player characters, and I'm the dungeon master. Uh, so normally we do this on stage in full costume, like with all our weapons and everything like that, uh, but. For this online version, everyone will be from their own homes, including Colin. And mm. uh, most people uh, will be wearing their costumes, or at least you know from here up, they'll they'll wear that much of their costume <laughs> and make makeup and whatnot. And Colin, uh, we usually rent a costume for him when he plays with us, but uh, he'll probably use a blanket as a cloak or something. I'm sure. I'm sure it'll be something <laughs> very inventive. What about you? Are you dressing up for it? Oh yeah, well now I'm the dungeon master, so I usually I wear just something simple, black robes or whatnot. Uh, mm. And uh, in the normal show, I, I we just sort of describe what I'm wearing if I'm turning into a different character or a monster or whatnot. Because I do what a dungeon master does in D and D. I play everyone, so I'm all the monsters, I'm all the townspeople, oh. mm -hmm. I'm all their their mentors, the guys who give them their missions, all that sort of thing. Uh, so I do have a large collection of props and costumes, so I might have to bust some of them out. At the I mean, I see a bunch of masks behind you already, and those oh, yes, are pretty yeah, cool yeah, over there. See. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, I got some swords too, so I think I'm, I think I'm well set. I think <laughs> like, is it? How long have you been playing D and D? Even like maybe before you're doing a show or anything? Have you been doing oh, D and D for a long time? Yeah, I was doing. I was playing Dungeons and Dragons long before I was acting. Uh, I started. Ooh, now I'm I'm quite old, Martin. I should explain that I'm very old. Uh, but I started playing uh, in 1981, so back when it was Advanced Dungeons and Dragons, the the first edition. And uh, I, I I about let's see, I think it was you look so young though. Well, thank you, thank you very much. It's it's Dungeons and Dragons. It keeps me young. Uh, <laughs> I, I I often actually I usually credit Dungeons and Dragons as being the first acting I ever did because. We didn't have drama in my high school. I went to school in a very small town, so they didn't have a drama program. So Dungeons and Dragons was my first experience with with acting, doing voices. Uh, uh, the group that I played with, we'd often play for laughs. So as a dungeon master, I'd be doing things like 
making Barney Rubble the innkeeper or throwing in other cartoon voices that uh, that I'd done before. And all the people I played with were fans of sketch comedy like you know Monty Python and SCTV. So yeah, we tended to play for laughs, and it became sort of an improv comedy thing. And is it then hard though? Like, so, I mean, I mean, does that really help you doing improv as well? Because you kind of have to think on the spot, especially like people have different idea of what they want to do in the campaign, and you suddenly is like, wait, that that that's not what you. I mean, okay, I guess you can do that, but I <laughs> yeah, it's uh, uh, improvisation is an invaluable skill for a dungeon master to have. I mean, the lessons that improv teaches you can be applied to so many things. Like we, often my theater group, we teach corporate improv classes to like uh, business people and just for team building and that sort of thing. So it doesn't, oh, yeah? it doesn't, it doesn't just have to be on stage. Uh, mm-hmm. But specifically Dungeons and Dragons, you know, the player characters can literally do anything. It's not like a video game where there, there are a set number of choices. You can do mm-hmm. whatever you want in Dungeons and Dragons because <laughs> it is largely a game that's played in your imagination. So being able to immediately throw out any plans that you had for the adventure, and it's just, well, they, they don't want to go on the adventure. They just want to they want to open an inn, and it's like, that's what the game's about now. It's opening an inn. So you have to, <laughs> you have to go roll with the punches and go with the flow. For your, all your D&D stuff that you're still doing right now, I know you say you're playing with friends, but uh, have you? I'm not sure if you have already. If not, have you considered doing like a podcast or something like that or a vodcast with it? Uh, well, I mean, it se- seems increasingly attractive in these pandemic times, certainly. Because we don't uh, know how long it's going to last, you know? Yeah, exactly. exactly. Up to this point, I've largely uh, been uh, a guest on other people's streams, and uh, mm-hmm. very nice, nice of them to invite me. I always enjoy going in and uh, dropping into campaigns, uh, sometimes as an NPC, sometimes as a PC. Uh, for example, I got to play... Uh, before the pandemic, uh, play a fair bit with Geek and Sundry. Uh, mm, they're cool people. Yes, exactly. And so uh, some of their shows, so like the Vampire the Masquerade show, L.A. by Night, I played on that. Mm-hmm. Uh, Eric Campbell uh, had me as a sort of recurring character on Callisto 6, which was a cyberpunk superhero game that he was doing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, yeah, so so up to this point, I I do like being a guest because that means I don't have to do any organization or work, and I can just sort of show up and play. Show up and, and do fun. the job, yeah. <laughs> yeah, show up, play, and have fun, and then yeah, let let someone else deal with the admin. Uh, and uh, I do have to say that I I love uh, I love DMing as well. Like mm-hmm. uh, I'm not sure if you know, I got to do D and D in a castle, uh, which was what it sounds like. Uh, it's a company that's actually based. Here I in heard Canada. about it. Yeah, yeah, and a lot of uh, a lot of big uh, people in the D and D and RPG community, like uh, Satine Phoenix and uh, Stefan Picorni and other folks, uh, they were involved as well. Uh, the Library Bards, uh, uh-huh. uh, Bonnie and Xander, they actually had me as a guest at their castle, and uh, it basically each group had their own castle in England, and people would sign up to come over, and we we. Like for what, four or five days, we would just play D and D nonstop, and then there were also activities like falconry and you know miniature painting workshops and all that. It was a very it was it was like going to uh, an extra nerdy Hogwarts because uh, you were living in a castle as well. So, did they time. stay there as well? Like, is it like mm-hmm. a, how big was it? Uh, th- th- I did several. I did a couple of different castles, uh, and oh, several different castles. Okay. Yes, yeah. There were the the company was running a few, and so each weekend was sort of like uh, a separate thing. So I went to, as I say, I went to two of them, and uh, each time my player group was about six people, and so it was a different group of people at each castle. And some of the dungeon masters went on went between castles. Some people could only. Uh, commit to do one week, for example. Uh, mm-hmm. But I, I, I had some free time last summer, and so I got to do two. And it was great. That's it was, awesome. It, it was a lot of fun. Uh, and, and as I say, it's uh, nerd Valhalla, really, because what could be better than just sitting around and playing Dungeons and Dragons for you know? And when you're not playing Dungeons and Dragons, many other awesome activities. Uh, but uh, and you're doing it all in an actual English castle. There, I have a question, then. Like, how? So. Before you doing all this D and D stuff, I know you play all the time. But mm-hmm. did you go to school for acting, or like what was it like? Because your high school didn't have anything. Like, where, where, no, how I, did your life get to here? I I did not uh, have any formal training for acting. I've I've had like quite a bit of training, but it's not. It's uh, more with 
improv companies and mm-hmm. uh, and theater companies as opposed to going to an accredited institution. Do you think it's all- even necessary though? Because like, for example, I'm a photographer. I feel like you don't need to go through photography or art school for it. But I mean, you can, it doesn't hurt, but it's not a necessity. That's how I see it. Well, I mean, as someone who didn't do it, obviously, I'm going to say it's like, yeah, of course, you don't do it. But I know, I, again, I work with I work with people who have had classical training, who've gone through, and they, they tend to be, you know, the triple threat types who like sing, dance, act. Mm. Uh, again, I I came to it more through improv and comedy clubs, uh, and then uh, got into acting through that. Uh, mm. So I mean, there are many ways there are many ways to approach it. Uh, ultimately, it. It's pretty, what you think is going to serve you best. Obviously, the connections that you make just going to drama school, like sometimes that can be as important as the training that you receive. Mm-hmm. And, and it's the same when you're, say, going with improv troops and going to festivals and taking workshops. Again, sometimes the, the contacts you make are just as valuable as the Actually, training. Actually, that's what I have heard. I have heard from other like art students and photography uh, students. They're saying like going to art school is more like paying a very expensive networking thing for like three years and sure that's like, yeah that's true and, yeah and uh i've got i have uh, many friends who are drama teachers and improv teachers and you know there are there are certainly lessons to be learned in uh in a more structured institutional setting but uh, that is that is not the path that i took personally mm-hmm, mm-hmm. yeah uh so how you know i'm gonna go jump right into it how did you got into doing mass effect stuff then well, I was fortunate enough uh, to live in Edmonton, where Bioware was based, and still is based. Mm-hmm. And uh, so before Mass Effect, this would have been back in the late 90s, really. Uh, I got in on the ground floor. I was I was lucky enough to get in on the ground floor back when Bioware was literally holding the old school cattle call auditions, where it's just, all right, everybody, everybody who wants to do some voice acting in a video game, show up at this studio, and we'll work through you all, and everybody, you know, you... It's it's not that big a community uh, acting wise, so you'll you'll see everybody you know with their mm-hmm. with their sides going in, going to the booth one at a time. And uh, I was fortunate enough that they cast me in Baldur's Gate two uh, on the strength of that audition, and I got one mm-hmm. line in the final cutscene of the game. So you had to complete you know forty hour game uh, before <laughs> you got to my one my one line. Uh, and it's funny because I was actually when when the game came out, I was like, okay, I'm gonna play this, get all the way through. Uh, and see my one line, uh, and this was before there were like you know really clips of games posted on YouTube and whatnot. Mm-hmm. You know there were some, but it was like yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. This, this specific thing. It's hard to find. So I was playing all the way through it, and it's not that easy a game. Like it's a pretty hard tactical game, uh, and I was playing on my roommate's computer. And just before I was getting to the end game, his computer crashed. And lost oh, all no. my save files. And you know, my roommate, he had stuff from work on there. He had like a, a couple of plays and a book he was working on on there. So I couldn't say like, "Oh, hey, could you try to recover my save files?" That was not his concern. So I didn't uh... actually. I never actually saw my scene until years later when somebody posted it on YouTube. <laughs> wow! Like, yeah, it's so different now because. Like now we have YouTube, we have Twitch. Like it's so easy to find clips, find any resources. But back then it's very different. Like you, it was, yeah. yeah. And games were very different too. Like there's no DLC, there's no internet, so people just pretty much just play games and just go along with it until whatever you know. There, there was an internet, but it was mostly message boards about Star Trek, and uh, yeah, <laughs> but it's still kind of beginning, you know. It's still yeah. not. It was yeah. a, uh, there was there was an internet back then. I'm not that old, but uh, <laughs> so yes, your original question was how to get to Mass Effect. So basically, I get that one line in Baldur's Gate when they and they were doing all the Dungeons and Dragons games uh, back then at Bioware. Uh, I think it was because I was a Dungeons and Dragons player because. They didn't have to explain Dungeons and Dragons to me. They could hand me a sheet and say, "This guy's a kobold shaman," and I wouldn't go, "What's a kobold? What's a shaman?" I they would just go, "Great, he's lawful evil, probably." And yeah, so uh, I, I worked on a lot of their games subsequently. In fact, al- almost everything that they put out. Like uh, I did uh, demo work on the original Knights of the Old Republic. Uh, I, yes, yeah, I did. I was actually the demo Carthonasi. And uh, Raphael Sabarge actually ended up being cast in that. So la- years later, I made jokes at Mass Effect panels that it's like, well, that's why I killed Caden on Vermeer because <laughs> Raphael took that gig from me. Tell but no, I, <laughs> I, I knew I was just the demo version. Uh, and then uh, 
for the most part, I was doing like you know monsters and uh, random bad guys and whatnot. Uh, I did some work on Jade Empire, which was a, an earlier uh, uh, martial arts uh, Bioware game. There was uh, there was you know many many gigs uh, after that with Bioware, and then when they started working on Mass Effect, before I was cast as Shepard, when everything was still in the concept art stages, I was brought in to essentially do a presentation on what the various alien races would sound like. So they, Bioware mm. hired me to, they gave me a big stack of reference material, just going, detailing all the alien races, their biology and their culture. And that is and like, did, did they come with art or is this all text and you have to imagine it? No, uh, there was there was some sample art as well. So I could mm. see, you know, this is what a Turian looks like. This is what an Asari looks like. This is what a Krogan looks like. Mm. Uh, and I came up with, okay, uh, sort of a, an auditory presentation of this is what a baseline Krogan sounds like, this is what a Solarian sounds like, a typical member of their species. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, some of it was very obvious, like the Krogans are huge, so they're going to have big, gruff voices. Yeah. And mm -hmm. uh, not all of my suggestions were taken. Like some, I was just spitballing at this point, so uh, <laughs> some suggestions weren't necessarily taken. Like uh, the Turians, because of the way their mouths were structured, I, I sort of pitched that they should have a sort of clicking sound when they talk. Mm -hmm. Uh, maybe before or after sentences. But this was before Garrus was actually in the game as a major party mm -hmm. NPC. And they they sort of went, well, you know, if he's going to have that much dialogue, this clicking thing is probably going to get really old after a while. <laughs> and I agree, I think it was the right choice. Uh, but so th some of my suggestions were taken, like the uh, the Volus. Uh, I suggested again, not not a not a huge leap to think that they would have this sort of wheezy sound when they talk because they wear that breathing apparatus. Mm -hmm. uh, I always say that I'm the reason that uh, Solarians kind of sound like Steve Buscemi because that was <laughs> that was the baseline. <laughs> that was essentially who I was impersonating when I did my typical baseline Solarian. And actually, if you go look at some early Mass Effect demos, uh, again, this was before a lot of people were cast, so they just had me do some demo stuff as Shepard and a Solarian bartender. And it's basically mm -hmm. just a scene where I'm threatening myself. So I come in as Shepard and like, you know, like give me information, things like that. And the Solarian mm -hmm. bartender's like, whoa, whoa, come down. Hey, what are you doing? Uh, so, so yeah, the, I think that stuff can be dug up if you look hard enough. Uh, so when, when you're doing like, um, let's say not even a uh, demo, let's say for real, because I'm not too familiar. Let's say you do have to play two characters. They're talking to themselves. Do you, do they go back to back or do you have to like pause and then they press a button or something to record the other person or like what's that like usually we we'll record each side of the dialogue separately so in that example i gave uh which i think was for an, an early e3 demo from the first mass effect but mm. uh basically i do all of shepherd's lines separately and then mm -hmm. i would do the solarian's lines or vice versa but while when i was doing the second person i'd have my performance from the first take in my uh, in my cans and i'd be able mm -hmm. to hear it uh, and react ah. myself. I wouldn't have to like remember what was going on. It would just. Mm -hmm. And they they used the same system for uh, for when I for in the main games and subsequent games when I was recording dialogue. Uh, if you were the very first person to record a given scene, then you'd sort of set the tone. But if you mm -hmm. came after other people had said it, then you'd have everybody else in in your That's headset. Cool with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Like, um, did you imagine Mass Effect to get this big? Because it's huge, like uh, for a big following, big like just everything. Uh, it, I mean, it took me by surprise how well received it was. I knew it would be a good game because Bioware uh, had always done good stuff up to that point. Uh, mm -hmm. But I, I often in interviews, I've I've talked about this before. The first time I realized that, like, oh, I think this is really <laughs> taking off, is when a guy in a really good Commander Shepard costume, you know, with armor with lights and the whole bit. Like mm -hmm. just walked walked past me at a con, and it was just like I had to, you know, of course chase him down and go, hey, yeah, yeah, yeah that, I do that guy's voice. Uh, and so I was I was just as excited uh, to meet him as, as he seemed to be to meet me because uh, mm -hmm. that was an excellent costume. And subsequently, of course, I've seen the kind of so effort many that Mass Effect fans put into these fantastic costumes and makeup and prosthetics and mm -hmm. puppets. Uh, that yeah, it's uh, it's clearly managed to find. Uh, a special place in people's heart. Just like even I have, power. I have shot so many. I've shot so many people cosplay in Mass Effect, and it's still. And when did it came out? Like it's all this year. Everyone are still cosplaying for Mass Effect. Well, this year is the tenth anniversary of Mass Effect Two. Um, mm -hmm. Actually, we just celebrated its release a couple of months ago, like the the anniversary. And uh, yeah, it's it still seems to be going strong in a lot of people's hearts. So that's that's very very gratifying to see. 
How did you decide to how to do Shepherd's voice? Is it like a person type that you're kind of thinking about? Or like, how do you come up with the, his voice? Well, of course, because Commander Shepard, uh, so Jennifer Hale and I both had the same sort of challenge. Uh, Commander Shepard is a character that can literally be almost anything. Uh, <laughs> because of the amount of choice they gave you in yeah. how Shepard reacts to things. Shepard could be every, anything from like a by the books, uh, essentially Boy Scout, or you know, just very, you know, a paladin, if you will, uh, mm -hmm. a, par a paragon of goodness who always <laughs> always does what's right, or a borderline sociopath <laughs> who is still saving the galaxy but not being very polite about it at all. It's a Superman uh, and Batman. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you could, yeah, very, very much a Superman Batman thing. They're both, they're both on, you know. Although I think full renegade Shepard is like <laughs> maybe even crossing lines that Batman wouldn't cross. Yeah. He, certainly, he certainly shoots people a lot. So mm -hmm. Batman does, tends not to like guns. Uh, yeah. But uh, yeah, that, that was the challenge. So working with our directors uh, and uh, the folks at Bioware, we did decide that the core of the character is essentially one thing that's the same across all iterations of Shepard, not just on the renegade paragon uh, scale, mm. but also uh, their background could be completely different. They could be essentially a military brat who's, uh, whose surviving parent is a high-ranking military officer. They could be somebody who grew up on the street, it was in a street gang for a while, it was, uh, was a criminal and then reformed. So the one thing that is constant is that they are someone who's been in the military for a long time and they're sort of a no-nonsense type that's mm. used to giving orders uh, and being calm under pressure. So that was that was mm. sort of the the base that we built the entire character with. And that actually changed throughout the games because mm. as we went from Mass Effect to Mass Effect 2 to Mass Effect 3, especially in the third game, uh, uh, they granted us a bit more leeway to loosen up as you see the effect that the war is having on Shepard and it's just mm. sort of breaking down their defenses and uh, they're allowing themselves to show uh, a little more of the human side of themselves. Uh, so mm. it was a really interesting process. So, like, because as you said, like, if you, the player, choose different options, it's kind of shaped the person differently. Mm -hmm. So, do you actually have to be, like, less expressive or, like, ha or, or change the way it's just trying to lock? It is, especially in the first game, like, we were noticing and we had to go back and, I had to do a bunch of line re-records because if you, uh, if you were leaning too much into the Paragon or Renegade, it sounded mm -hmm. like, sh like, not everyone is going to play a pure Renegade or pure, pure Paragon game. Mm -hmm. So if you're bouncing back and forth between those options, it it would sound like Shepard was having like really wild <laughs> mood swings, and it's like it's kind of two different people uh, answering depending on the line. So mm -hmm. so yeah, that was one. Uh, if I ever got a note, it was always just like, okay, we're gonna have to you know take the emotional tone of this down a bit. And again, going back to that baseline of Shepard is a military officer and used to dealing with pressure and these kind of rough situations. Uh, but as I say, as we went forward into Mass Effect 3, then we were allowed to loosen that up a little bit. So unlike the, the other game, you have one line. For Mass Effect, for Shepard, like, how long did it take you to finish like one game? It's also, it's like Mass months. Effect a lot more? Yeah, mm -hmm. it was it was months and months. Uh, I mean, if you if you count like the early demo stuff, uh, I started working on Mass Effect in 2005. Probably and so and the game didn't drop until 2007. As I say, a lot of that was early prep stuff, and because before I was cast as Shepard, I was working on the alien stuff anyway. Uh, it it did, however, get longer. the The amount of dialogue, of course, just increased exponentially from game to game because mm -hmm. you had to deal with all the branching possibilities. Yeah. So, for example, in Mass Effect Two, I had to record scenes with characters that potentially the player might have killed in mm. Mass Effect 1 that they might never see because they killed that character, but you had to cover all the options. And so it just sort of branched out further and further, and especially by the time you got to Mass Effect 3, there was just way more dialogue. And it's a very good thing that we moved from paper script. For the first game, we had paper scripts. Uh -huh. uh, and there were just huge, huge stacks in the recycling <laughs> bin. Uh, so I don't know how many forests we would have gone through by the by Mass Effect 3, but fortunately by then we'd moved to uh, just having all the lines on an iPad, essentially, or a tablet. As you said, like the game, you know, uh, for those you know, people who don't know, like the game actually have different options and branch out differently. Um, w are there like some other games, like uh, developments that never made it into the game? So you're like, oh, this could have gone this way and you maybe wish it was in there or something like that? Well, there's, uh, there is some stuff actually uh, in... Uh 
this had changed by Mass Effect 3. Uh, one of the the big things uh, with Mass Effect 3 was that there were a couple of a couple of relationship paths that opened up. Mm -hmm. So male Shepard could romance Caden, uh, mm -hmm. for example. But that had actually been the plan from Mass Effect 1. It was just there was there was so much, and we'd actually recorded the dialogue for that for the mm -hmm. uh, for the male Shepard Caden romance, uh, and then. It was actually still in the game because gamers have managed to go in and uh, on PC gamers obviously and go in and dig through the code and mm. pull those scenes out and some of them I, I, I've seen them on YouTube like they're not actually in the game playable but it's buried in the code so they went in mined <laughs> it pulled it out and you can actually see those scenes uh, so that yeah so the the male Shepherd Caden was uh, relationship was always a plan from Mass Effect one it's just they didn't have the, the time or resources to implement everything so mm. yeah they're there's entire there are scenes that I can think of that got you know we recorded dialogue for but they got cut they didn't make it into the game for whatever reason usually it's time crunch more than anything else it's just there's there's only so many hours in the day and they only have so many people working on it but uh, it was it was good to to see that they brought it in by the by Mass Effect three and that and that relationship actually was an option for players does it feel crazy because like again it's all these options then it feels like you just going to do a time loop over and over and over again. Because most yeah. things you voice acting, it's like, it's a chronological timeline. It's like, okay, you mm -hmm. go from A to B, but this like, okay, cool. A, B, C, back to B, C, B, A, A, B. Like, does, does it feel like that? Uh, it could. And uh, that's why we really relied on our directors. Uh, the director I worked most with was uh, Caroline Livingstone. I also worked with uh, Shauna Perry at Bioware for the, for the first game. And uh, they were both great at being able to give us context and just go, so it's not just lines. It's so, okay, this is what has just happened. If you'll mm. remember, we recorded this part of the scene before, so now we're going back into that scene, and that really helps. Uh, and, of course, I, I would also credit my experience as an improviser uh, with mm -hmm. helping with that aspect, too, because you're able to just sort of jump right in uh, and and hit the ground running, so to speak. Because like for me, I, if I do that, I would feel like having some kind of uh, mental disorder. Because like, wait, hold on, wait, I, I thought I just did this. Wait, no. And then especially they have different options, like, Wait, no, hold on. It feel like you're living in like five different timeline at the same time. It was oh. a bit like that. But like I said, our directors did a great job Good. at uh, helping us understand where in the narrative things were taking place. Are they planning to make more Mass Effect? Uh, you, do, you know what I know. You see, I see rumors every now and then. I, um, I don't know. I mean, if, they, if I knew, if I knew, I, I couldn't you tell you. You can't tell me so. anyway. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> if they do remake, I mean, not remake, if they make another one, are you? would you be willing to... Go back in uh, again? <clears throat> well, I, I'm willing, but only under any circumstances. <laughs> of course, yeah, I would love to. But that said, uh, this it depends on the story they want to tell. I am content that you know the trilogy is Shepard's story, and mm -hmm. uh, if that if that is all there is, then I'm certainly content. But if they wanted to do more with Shepard, of course, I would say yes. Or or if they just wanted to have a bunch of Borcha in the game, because I do a, a bunch of alien voices too. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep, yep. And you know, you have been doing, of course, Mass Effect for years, but you also have done many different uh, stuff. You know, as you said, you do theater, you do D and D. Mm -hmm. um, is it? Do you feel weird or like annoyed? I mean, it's it's kind of like a. I'm not sure it's a double edged sword. Do you feel like people when they meet you or when they see you or when they introduce you, they're like, oh yeah, yeah, this is uh, the guy from, uh, he's a voice actor oh. for Mass Effect. And then you're like, yes, that, I mean, that is what I do, but I also well, do many other things. Well, sure. But I mean, I think more people have played Mass Effect than came to see my improv comedy show. So, <laughs> so yeah, it, it casts a wider net and it's completely understandable. And I certainly have no problem uh, uh, being referred to as the guy who did Mass Effect or, you know, when people like, when people book me on Cameo or whatnot, if they want a Mass Effect catchphrase, I am happy to give them a Mass Effect catchphrase. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I feel like, especially now when quarantine, a lot of uh, actors, actress, both voice or like on screen, uh, they do a lot of uh, the Cameo thing. How is that going along? Is it fun? Is it interesting? Oh, yeah, it's fun. Because there's, there, uh, there people have usually things like birthday messages and whatnot. Uh, although recently, uh, somebody actually booked me to play basically do a cameo in their D&D &D game as, uh, <laughs> as an NPC. So they gave me like a little thing of what he is supposed to say, and I, I read it out. It was lots of fun. The guy was actually a, or the character was a Rakshasa. So I actually went the extra mile, and I had sort of like a, a panther mask, so I put that on. And, uh, you know, I'm a nerd. I enjoy that kind of thing. Uh, I like it because like everyone on it seems to be, they, they can do it very easily, you know? They don't have to 
seem to be too uh, formal. You know, they seem to be able to just do it with their phone and everything, and I think people mm-hmm. love it. Yeah, it's it's fun. It's a nice way to connect with the fans. Uh, it was actually Jennifer Hale who uh, who convinced me to sign up for it. Uh, so uh, so thanks to her. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what about uh, what's the next? Uh, so I'm sure again, you're a big nerd. Would mm. you want to still do more like uh, game voice acting, or is there like other plan for other stuff that you would like more to explore more other than just video games? <laughs> Well, I mean, uh, I, I have done animation stuff in the past, and, you know, when you're an actor and a working actor and you have no other job, you basically take the jobs that come along. So it's like you might be doing a play one day or a commercial the next day or uh, doing an audiobook or, or what have you. So, yeah, I'm, I'm usually up for anything. Uh, I, do, I do love live performance, which is why the pandemic is a little hard on me because it is. I, don't, I don't get to be on stage in front of an audience, and we don't quite know when that's going to be possible again. Uh, as I was saying to you earlier, you know, live performance theater, uh, comedy, that's probably going to be one of the last things to come back <laughs> from all of this. Uh, it's going to be a slow, slow uphill climb. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, yeah, I, I, I do love live performance uh, the most. Uh, did, and was it like when you first got started, it's like, did you have to do a lot of... Uh... Is it hard to pick up? Because I feel like a lot of people want to do either voice acting or doing improv or like me. I even consider doing like comedy. I'm not sure yet. Again, as you said, I'm not sure when it's going to be over. But mm. I, I want to start writing like, you know, a at least a, a small stand up a little bit. And then I'm not telling anyone about it. But just, you know, try to put my foot in there. Just give it a try. Yo, why but, not? Yeah. yeah, I think I'll do it. It's, mm. But is this a hard journey or like how is that like starting out? Uh, it's it's a very hard journey, and I'm, I'm not a stand-up myself, but I have been assured by my friends who are stand-up comedians that it's much a much lonelier experience than improv, and I can see that because it is just you. Uh, I tend to perform uh, uh, in a two-person uh, comedy show called uh, Atomic Improv. We do short-form improv, and we, we often play comedy clubs, so I hang out with stand-ups, uh, but uh, yeah... <laughs> I don't know. I'm as I say, it is it is a lonely path, the path of the stand up comedian. Yeah, but this, I don't know. I'll I'll see. I mean, it's something that I want to try to do, but I don't think I'll actually go far. It's hard because like I already do so many things, right? Uh, mm-hmm. like most people know me as a photographer, especially in the scene of cosplay as a cosplay photographer. Mm-hmm. And, and well, that's uh, that's how I met you. You, uh, yeah. you took my photo. Yeah, yeah and actually, yeah, yeah. now that I think about it, it was. It was you and uh, like Jessica and yeah, Leanna Ryan and Leanna and Cam. You were you're mm-hmm. you guys are the reason that I have an Instagram account. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> I resisted for so many years, and then when we were all in New Zealand together, you guys would not let up. You're just like you got to get an Instagram. And it's like finally on the. I think on the last day, I was like, okay, I signed up. There you go. <laughs> Next so time you're in LA, that. let me know. We can get some uh, photos again because I'm not sure when sure. I'm gonna be in, up in Canada, but yeah. I don't know when any of us are going to be in each other's country because, uh, of course, the border is currently closed right now. We'll, yeah, uh, that's the other thing I was I was talking about with some friends in the states with it. Um, assuming that you know air travel is possible again, like is the quarantine thing still going to be in effect? So will you have to have two weeks on either side of any trip? So you'd have mm-hmm. to like if I was flying down to the states, I'd have to fly down and then have somewhere to quarantine for two weeks. And then mm-hmm. do whatever I was doing, then fly back to Canada, and then quarantine for two weeks in my house. That's my uh, problem right now. My parents yeah. wanted to go back to Hong Kong, but mm-hmm. then if they go back to Hong Kong, they would have to quarantine themselves for two weeks, yeah, and then do other stuff. And I mean, I mean, good thing that they the hotels are really cheap right now, so they might still do it. But there's just, that. Yeah, but it's, it's just <laughs> annoying though, right? Yeah, it's no, it's true. Hotels would be a lot cheaper than they are regularly these days. Uh, but uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I've I've been in my house for you know three months, so or mm, coming mm. up on three months. Yeah, I I I mean, I'm not sure when's the next time cruise is even an option because you're not just stuck on stuck on plane. Sorry, bad like 14 hours flight. Mm-hmm. You're stuck on a plane for a long time, but on a cruise, it's like what seven days, some of them. So yeah, yeah, it's uh. It's it's a it's a hard time for quite a few industries. Does it change your industry in any way? Like, do you think it, it we're gonna be have some reform? Because most a lot of other jobs, right? People are starting to discover remote is an option. People can mm-hmm. work remotely, and then they're like, oh, okay, maybe this is an possible options. But many things that you do, especially live performance, that cannot do remote. But is there something that you think that would change that the industry a bit? Like, is there like self made? sound booth that make it more common now or like what is it like 
Uh, well, I have one of those now. I, up, <laughs> up until this point, I wasn't one of the people who had a home studio. But uh, I've got, you know, got some equipment uh, from friends and I've been able to uh, record some stuff. And we haven't, uh, for example, uh, The Long Dark, which is a video game I'm working on with Jennifer Hale, as a matter of fact. Mm. Uh, we, we put out uh, episode updates, essentially, a bit like the old uh, Telltale Walking Dead games and whatnot. Uh, and we just dropped uh, a new batch of episodes. So when mm. it comes time to record the new episodes, yes, theoretically, I could do that from my house. Uh, I could do uh, audio and voice stuff from my house, but again, we're it's not everyone, ideal. Not ideal, but not ideal. Uh, uh, especially because the studios that I worked with uh, before the pandemic, they're very close to my house, and I really like the people who run them. So I'd I'd like to work with them again. Mm -hmm. uh, the The thing with live theater is it's a puzzling one, and it's it's difficult. Uh, a lot of the theater companies I've been involved with, we have been doing stuff on Zoom, and it's it's uh, it's a different art form different, than, yeah. uh, than live theater. Uh, as I say, we'll be experimenting a little further with that on Saturday night when I do uh, the improv D and D show with Colin. Because up until this point, we've always done that on stage. I know that mm -hmm. you play D and you know I, I played a lot of D and D online, but mm -hmm. this show is something that uh, we'd always done in costume and running around on yeah. stage and acting everything out. So it's also different. You know, yeah. like yeah. I, I've, I've been telling friends too, like sometimes I joke about this where I'm doing this, you know, uh, broadcast, this like broadcast I'm doing where I'm talking to friends. It's just mostly me wanting some human interactions, but it's still not the same as, you know, in person, you know, kind of thing. It's true. Yeah. 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 Like uh, for, shit, I forgot my question. I was going to uh, ask you something about, see, no, not D&D, not games. Oh, yes. This is Ooh. something I, I think I want to, so I convinced you, we convinced you on the Instagram thing. I think your next thing you should also try out doing streaming Twitch. Some Twitch streaming. You're not the first. You're not the first person. I, I know it's that. definitely not the first person. <laughs> just imagine you just playing Mass Effect. I know it's weird because <laughs> it's like, mm. you know, you you are the character, but also like I feel like you would get a lot of attraction for that. Uh, well, uh, my friend uh, DC Douglas, uh, who plays Legion in uh, the Mass Effect trilogy, is mm. also uh, the voice of Wesker in. Resident mm. Evil, and he is currently doing that. He's doing. He calls it DC Douglas plays Resident Evil Three badly. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm sure yeah. he's. And DC is a very entertaining guy, so uh, I'm sure it is a joy. Have to you watch. have you considered it? Maybe the the funny thing is that uh, despite the pandemic, I'm actually quite busy. I'm doing a lot of stuff for Ooh. free, but uh, because uh, I'm involved in a lot of theater companies and stuff, we're doing all mm -hmm. these sort of online things. And plus, you know, I do have to have time for miniature painting so mm, yeah that's cool uh so yeah i'll yeah you know it 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 took you know, a while to wear me down on instagram so maybe i'll eventually start doing a twitch stream but as i say up till for right now i'm content to guest on my friend's streams and the thing is there's there's a lot of people with streams so uh <laughs> that's good I, I mean as long as I, you're keeping yourself busy that that's a cool thing you know this is true like show me a mini show me that one again this one okay so this how is long did it take you I take forever. I'm not a really quick painter, so I probably worked on him on and off for a couple of days. Mm. Let's see, there we are. There we are. He is from uh, the uh, Nolzer's Marvelous Miniatures line, I believe. Oh, and then this guy—he he was actually what I started with when I did my started my <laughs> pandemic painting. Little uh, Star Spawn, Star Spawn of Cthulhu. He's not the real awesome. Cthulhu. Cthulhu would be much bigger. He's just a—he's mm. just a Star Spawn. And let's see. In reaching distance, I have. Oh, okay. I got this guy. Earth Elemental. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And then this is what I am in the process of painting right now. Do you use them for your D&D as well? Sorry? Do you for use them for your, yeah. I do, uh, obviously not the online ones because we're usually mm. using Roll20 or something like that where they have the the uh, computer tokens. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I've been, I've been adding to my, or actually rather... I'm not adding to my collection during this. I'm just finally painting all the ones that I haven't painted. Yeah, I'm sure it'll take, yeah, it'll take a long time. I thought about no, doing it, time. but hey, here's the thing, because we met at a convention, and mm -hmm. you know I, I go to a lot of conventions as well. I so do. that's why I never did D&D. Like, not never, but I don't really do D&D because I feel so ir irresponsible if I join a campaign, especially the long ones. <laughs> yes. Very true. Well, I, like I said, this uh, this game campaign that I started since the pandemic, it's the first time that I've been able to be a, a player character in an ongoing campaign in quite a while. 
and we're playing twice a week, so it's you know, I'm getting I'm getting to see those guys way more often than I would have if there hadn't been a pandemic. Um, kind of ironic. It, <laughs> yeah, and and also they're in the UK and New Zealand, so yeah, it's uh, they're they're probably oh. the people I've seen the most. <laughs> what time do you guys play then? Because time zones. Well, I mean, oh yeah, the time zones are hilarious. So I uh, I'm usually playing in the early afternoon. For me, it's late mm-hmm. at night for the guys in the UK, and our dungeon master has to get up at around 7 a.m. in New Zealand. <laughs> That's more than like a full-time job. It's like, yep, yep, sorry, honey, Ugh, I have to wake up. Yeah, we're going to play d and I know, I know, I'm sorry, I have to do this. <laughs> <laughs> so, so qu- question too, like for your other theater stuff, I know, I know as you said, like people doing Zoom now, there's different kind of structure. Is it affecting them also? Like they have to uh, maybe, are they able to survive? Like are they sustainable? Uh, sorry, is what sustainable? Like, like, are they sustainable? Like the the theater themselves, because they usually re- rely on ticket sales, right? Yes. Uh, now they're doing this. Is it like a ticket t- ticket sales situation still, or like how does it work? Well, the the show that I'm uh, doing on Saturday is with Rapid Fire Theater, and it's actually a non profit uh, society. Uh, so they do have uh, a donate button, I believe. Uh, so the the show is free, uh, but they do ask. They say if you were able to donate to Rapid Fire, that'd be nice because. All theater companies are really feeling the crunch across the world. Uh, Mm -hmm. And as I say, it's one of the hardest hit industries and will be one of the last to recover. Yeah, and it's not like Uber Eats. You cannot just like order from (laughs) from home Mm -hmm. or something, you know? No, no. Uh, People are being creative. I know uh, some uh, performers are doing what they call curbside shows where basically (laughs) it's like a big yard party, but everyone's in their own yard and... Uh, you know, socially distant, obviously, and uh-huh. you'll, they basically just come out and play music or do stand-up comedy on the curb uh, <laughs> for, for everybody on the street and, like, with the speaker system and whatnot. So we, we will see. Um, I do look very forward to the day when an audience can come in and sit in the theater again and, uh, and watch a show. Uh, what's your favorite one so far of the, of the show that you've done so far, you know, theater show? Theater show, okay. The, um, there's there's one that's quite near. It's probably because I've done it most recently. But I I wrote a play called Fear and Loathing and Lovecraft. Uh, as you mm. can see, I, you saw that Cthulhu earlier. I'm a bit of a Cthulhu fan. Lovecraft. <laughs> ah yes. Uh, but the, this show is actually adapted from a novel called The Damned Highway uh, mm. by uh, Brian Keane and Nick Mamatis, and it's best described as Hunter S. Thompson meets H.P. Lovecraft. Uh, okay. So okay. It, if you've ever read Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, it's written like that. Uh, the main character is quite clearly an homage to Hunter S. Thompson. And uh, rather than going to Vegas, he goes to Lovecraft Country, so to Arkham and, uh, and Dunwich and, yeah, uh, and uh, Innsmouth. Uh, and so, yeah, it's, it's, again, the sort of weird, drug-fueled craziness of Hunter S. Thompson meets the insanity and cosmic horror of H.P. Lovecraft. And uh, it's a lot of fun. So I do that. That's a one-man show I do. So I play, obviously, the Hunter S. Thompson in it, but I also play all the other characters. And uh, it's uh, been, let's see, that was actually one of the last shows I did live. I did it down at Dad's Garage Theater in Atlanta. Uh, mm. Great great theater down there in Atlanta, uh, good friends of mine. And uh, they, they had me down there. I did, uh, did a little run of that. Uh, and I did it uh, at fringe festivals and whatnot. Uh, I was looking forward to touring that show a bit more, and hopefully, I will get the yeah. chance before too long. Hopefully, it's weird the pandemic. Like I, and we all know it's coming, kind of like because we've seen what happened in China and the rest of the world, and especially Italy. But then I feel like for North America, it. I mean, you Canada is doing a great job obviously but we're doing okay we're doing okay i know uh, much better quebec has has been sort of the the center of our outbreaks uh and Mm -hmm. where i am in edmonton especially we have we managed to flatten the curve early on and we we have a handful of cases so things are slowly opening up again here but of course you have to be careful because the virus is out there and uh, if you res if you relax restrictions too much then we're just back in the same situation and it was all for nothing. That's, it. That's the thing. Yeah. We can't make what we've gone through over the last few months be for nothing. Uh, Luke, yeah. We have to make it count. It felt very sudden. Like, I know we saw it coming, but I remember uh, in March, I was still at a friend's house, and then suddenly we got an email or notification that's saying, uh, you know, we have now decided to do shelter in place, you know, social distancing. And just like in one week, within a week, everything seemed to be shut down and done. 
And yeah, it did. I mean, when it happened, it you know obviously there were some who would go, like, yeah, it didn't happen soon enough. Uh, but when it it did seem to happen very quickly. Like I was in the states uh, at the end of February. I came back here, and within a few days of getting back to Canada, uh, that's when they started recommending, oh, okay, quarantine yourselves for two weeks. And I I was like, I, I've been home two weeks. Do I need to quarantine? I I don't know. Uh, so and then let's see. I think for me it was like March 15th or March 16th when it was just like now everything is shut down. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah. it was probably similar for you as well. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. no, I mean, I'm glad you made it home because I, I know some people can't cannot make it home. They really like stuck in a country or stuck in a different state or something like that. A lot of New Yorker I know are stuck outside from New York because they can't go back. And I mean, it might be better for them anyway, but still it's just... It's, it's no, annoying. of course, to, to be away from home during this... Yeah, I'm. I'm very glad that I was at home in my house when everything when everything went down, because yeah. uh, to be on the road. And then, of course, there were there were the poor people who were stuck on on cruise ships. Uh, mm. You know, there were kids that were on school trips over in Europe or overseas, and they weren't able to get home. So, yeah, it's a uh, it's a very crazy time. It is. Uh, but I mean, in the meantime, I guess for some people, it's good for practicing stuff. Uh, do you have any advice, actually, for uh, people that want to get into like voice acting stuff? What's the, what's the best way for them to do so? Well, uh, if you do what I did, just play a lot of D and D. Uh, <laughs> I would uh, seriously, though, like the the thing I was saying earlier about improvisation. Uh, the lessons that improv teaches you, as I said, can be applied to many many aspects uh, of different fields, and for voice acting especially i think it's it's really valuable it's a very valuable skill to have and beyond that the contacts that you make uh may lead to other things and other shows mm -hmm. and yeah. and also just enjoying yourself and having a good time pretending with your friends it's funny because uh a lot of my friends are nerds you know like all of us but most nerds that i know are introverts so it's really mm -hmm. for them to do stuff like you know of course, um, improv or you know comedy or voice acting because they're just so shy about it. So, you no, know, maybe as you said, they just have to do it more and really put themselves out there and give it a try. Improv is like anything else; it's a skill, and the more you do it, the more you learn, and the better you get at it. And uh, I mean, like you said, like that. Well, you were saying that most uh, of your friends who are nerdy would not like to do improv uh, necessarily because they're introverted, but. The, you know, when I think of improvisers that I know, it's like almost all of them are nerds. <laughs> like they, <laughs> you know, if you had the Venn diagram of like D and D nerds and improvisers, it's just a circle. It's just a circle. <laughs> it's the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Like no, like, I, I'm an extreme ex extrovert, so I'm kind of annoyed I'm stuck at home. But you know what? There's, I'm saving someone's grandma, making sure they're not getting sick. So I guess. <laughs> all right. No, well, wait. Actually, now that I think of it, it would be two circles because so. It, a circle that says improvisers and D&D &D nerds and then a smaller round ring of nerds around them. You just have to be correct <laughs> on my Venn diagram. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, anyway, uh, thank you so much for being here. You know, I had a great time. Uh, also, where can people find you? Ah, well, let's see. You can book me on Cameo, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, you can find me on Instagram, thanks to Martin uh, yeah. and, and other friends, at uh, Mr. Mark Mir. That's M-R period Mark Mir. And you can find me on Twitter at Mark underscore Mir. I'm afraid I do not have uh, a unified username across my social media platforms. You should find some way to either consolidate them or find out whoever had those. Just hunt <laughs> them down. That's true. That's true. Ah, that's all right. I'm I'm living, let live. Oh, and uh, I should also mention that you can watch my television show, Tiny Plastic Men. I'm one of the co-creators of it, one of the writers, and one of the stars. It's about uh, three guys who work as prototype testers at a toy factory, uh, and they're the guys that work in the best basement, test all the toys, and all the toys that company makes are either really dangerous or very inappropriate or possessed or sentient or yeah. So it's a fun show. Uh, we've got four seasons uh, available on Amazon Prime. In the USA, Canada, the UK, and I believe Australia and New Zealand as well. That's great. A lot of people on Twitch that actually has Amazon Prime because they use it for Amazon or like Twitch Prime to kind of like sell people with Amazon stuff. That's yeah. perfect. That, wor that works out well. Yeah. For yeah. Me. Awesome. Awesome. Well, yes, please, everyone, go check him out and follow him on Twitter and Instagram, especially Instagram because, you know, we've decided it's supposed something he should do long ago and he finally did it. <laughs> I finally did. I finally did. But we'll yeah. see you about the Twitch streaming. Yeah. Let me know. If you do, let me know. I'll help you along the way to set up everything. So it'll be really easy. Yeah. Thanks, man. I'll let, I'll, as soon as I finish this huge box of unpainted miniatures, I'll get to you. 
took forever. But yeah, next time you're in LA, please let me know so you know we can get some food, get some photos. Do some of fun course, stuff. Ben. Be good to yeah. see it, and I'm glad right. to see you tonight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, stay on this for a little bit. But everyone else that's watching, thank you so much. Uh, you know, I'll see y'all next time. Uh, next Tuesday. Yeah, next Tuesday. Every Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday here at 7 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, hopefully I can do this for a while because it's, it's fun. But thank you so much for watching and I will see y'all next time. All right. Bye.